Amen. I want to welcome you to our Palm Sunday uh, services. This is Palm Sunday. For those of you who did not grow up going to church, is the Sunday before Easter. If you have no idea kind of how all this liturgical stuff works or even what that word was that I just said, I'm going to explain it all this morning. Uh, I, di- I didn't grow up going to church, and so I had to start learning about all this stuff as an adult when people were asking me questions like, does your church do this? And I was like, hold on, Siri, do we, per- you know, like I... No, I I knew a little bit before then, but Palm Sunday, if you grew up going to a church where maybe, especially where you're like, you kind of was a lot of stand up, sit down and, you know, a lot of book opening and singing songs out of your uh, range, uh, you, you, you knew that it was the palm branches and it's a day that's very special in the calendar as it reminds us and marks Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem and closes out the season of Lent as we head into Holy Week. And as we use those words like Lent, Advent, or or, or I'm going to use it, Advent, Lent, Easter, Holy Week, Palm Sunday, all of those are part of what's called the liturgical or the Christian calendar. So around 400 years after the resurrection of Jesus, the church started to put into practice this kind of year-long kind of template of celebration of the way that they would remember things, the, the most important things, not the only things, but the most important things about their faith so that they didn't get forgotten. Honestly, it's a lot of the ways that we've constructed our sermon calendar as well. We have a couple themes that we hit on every single year. We try to do it a little bit differently. But again, if you're not familiar with it, I want to explain actually what this liturgical calendar is. What does is, what is this traditional calendar look like? And it looks a lot like, like this right here. So the whole calendar starts with Advent. How many of you have ever been with us when we celebrated Advent, okay? So Advent starts the whole thing off. Why does Easter move back and forth all the time? Why does all this stuff change around? It's because uh, we, we start with Christmas and everything starts with Christmas and then we go Four Sundays before that begins the Advent celebration. And that's when we begin our Advent celebration, four weeks or three weeks or five weeks, depending upon when our Christmas services are, before Christmas. Look, we're celebrating it, okay? And and it's a reminder of anticipation. Jesus is coming. Then we celebrate Christmas. Christmas is not actually one day. Christmas is a season. It's it's a multi-day thing. Kids, that does not mean that you get presents for multiple days. You're like, it's still Christmas season. Like, nope, that's not how it works which leads us into Epiphany. Any Tarpon Springs folks here in the audience have heard that word, and you're like, I know Epiphany. That's the day we all got off of school to watch a bunch of kids try to murder each other under the water so that they could get across and not get good luck that year. You know, I mean, but actually Epiphany has become very important in uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, but it's been part of the liturgical calendar as as a reminder of the power and life of Jesus. And then we enter into some, I swear this is what it's called, normal time. It's just normal time. And then off of that begins a season of Lent. Lent, which many people know, is when people like to announce to everybody what they're giving up so that they seem, guys, I'm just giving up social media for Lent. I just want to know, let you know on social media, I'm getting up. You know, like, you know, it's like, I'm giving up drunk driving for Lent. It's like, no, 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 it doesn't count if you're giving up the things you should not be doing anyway. You know, like, of giving up ninth meal. Like, don't do it. Just don't eat nine meals. You know, like, just give up those things. But Lent is a time of sacrifice and denial and kind of focusing on the heaviness of our faith in preparation for the resurrection. Then we enter into where we begin today. We enter into the, the tritum, or what we would more commonly call Holy Week, and then into the Easter season, which leads us into Pentecost, which we'll also be celebrating on Sunday this year. And then again, after the end of Pentecost, which will be June 5th, to the beginning of Advent is back again to normal time. That, that's the calendar that things would go and cycle through. Again, if you, if you went to a more liturgical church growing up, and when I say that, I mean they, they tended to celebrate this. Their worship was oriented around this. Not only would you perhaps have a hymnal in front of you, but you would have readings or, or homilies that would come out of a book that was kind of already pre-written. And today we're celebrating this scripture. In the fifth week, we, we read this scripture because it was, hey, let's remember these important things. And there's a danger in looking at tradition and going, ah, oh, yeah, but that's just tradition. Tradition's bad. Tradition is boring. No, it can be bad and it can be boring, but anytime the what you do is divorced from the why you do it, it the, the what is always going to seem very empty. 
So the reason we're taking some time to talk about Advent and Epiphany and normal time and all this kind of stuff is as we start to practice these things, as we start to participate in them, to be able to bring meaning, to be able to bring purpose, to be able to to bring our hearts into them and behind them, rather than to just say, oh, it's a a tradition, it's an old thing. There's a lot of traditions. We're going to celebrate communion later. That's a tradition. And it's not for us to be able to say that they're bad. It's to, again, continue to put meaning behind them. Robert Weber, who wrote a lot about what this kind of blended worship should look like, said we should not look to Palm Sunday simply as a day to just recall that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. It's more than that. It's the culminating events of his earthly life. It leads to the most holy, solemn, and serious day of the year, where we will experience and encounter our own destiny in the destiny of Christ's death and burial and triumphant resurrection from the dead. If we miss these days, we have missed the heart of a full year's spiritual pilgrimage. And so again, we talked about we're entering into Holy Week. Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday and then continues on to Monday, Thursday, which is a remembrance of the Lord's Supper. If you've ever uh, been to a Monday, Thursday service, especially if you were I can, uh, went to Florida State uh, growing up. I don't know where, where Lauren is, but she would know what this is. We, we always did this thing at our, at our school where they'd get everybody together and you'd have a stranger wash your feet and, and then eat a cracker. And you're like, I, is this making me closer to Jesus or giving me anxiety? You know, like I don't. But then Monday, Thursday, which leads into Good Friday, a weird thing that we call good, it, oh, it's a celebration of Jesus' death. There's nothing on Saturday to then the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday, three days later. Now, we are a very excitable church. We're very excitable people. We're big, loud, boisterous people like me, Pastor Mason, Pastor Casey, Pastor... (laughs) I didn't know what they were going to do. And so, uh, uh, but there's a lot, I mean, like, you never get like Mason and I on stage and we're like, good morning, everybody. You'd be like, oh, what's wrong with him? Like, we're like, woo, let's go, let's go, let's have some enthusiasm. It's like, again, if you've been to, sometimes people come to our church and be like, you guys are too excited. We're like, no, you're not excited enough. Let's go, you know, like, we never like, sing a little quieter, you know, we're like, it's, it's like, whisper to the Lord all the earth it can't hear. Like, we don't, like, that's not literally our vibe, you know, like, we're, we're up. But here's the danger. If you are always up, then up becomes just white noise. And to have the richness and fullness of the Christian experience, you also need to have moments of meditation. You need to have moments of weight. And you need to have moments of quietness. And as we're going to actually have some moments of quiet later on in the service, I know that silence is perhaps one of the most terrifying things in our modern culture because it leaves you alone with your own thoughts. And when we think about... like today, like Palm Sunday, it will be a heavier day. There there will be celebration, but that celebration should come in response. I was sharing with somebody who was new to the church uh, in the the first service, and we were talking about how we have music at the end, I said, it's become a response for us. It's a way to process through the word that God is speaking to us, and it'll be the same thing today. But the way that we respond comes from what we're responding to. And when we think about sin, and weight and the heaviness of who we were and what we're still going through. There can be times where we go, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about it. But the more you think about it, where you've come from, the weight that you bear, what it took to save you, the more that celebration becomes real. Woo! Because you know what you're actually celebrating. If you're like, well, I'm fine. Jesus has just given me a little upgrade. Then you just do little upgrade of worship. You're like, yeah, speak the name. I'm not going to sing it, but I'll maybe speak it. 
But when you realize and remember, oh, I wasn't just a good person who got a little bit of an upgrade. When you realize I was broken, I was lost, I couldn't save myself, I was bearing an unheavy yoke, I, I, I was feeling the weight of it, my sins put him on the cross, I was disobedient, I was serving myself, I was serving everything else but him. And when you feel that weight on top of you, and then you remember, oh, wait, he lifted that off of me, actually remembering how down I was lets me go that much higher in my worship. So it'll be a little heavy today so that we can remember the joy of the lightness, the joy of our salvation. We are holding in holy tension today Jesus' triumphant entry and knowing in just a few days he will be crucified. It is joy and sorrow mixed. It's the epitome of our Christian life knowing that he has come already to set us free, but we are not quite experiencing the fullness of heaven and the resurrection in the seat back in front of you, you've got the sermon notes card. If you don't have a notes app on your phone that is easy to access, I would encourage you to have something to be able to write not only some things down at the end, but you know, over the next 40 to 45 minutes, you might hear something that you like, so you could write something down. That was an actual joke. Uh, we're not, I'm not going that, that long. 52 minutes, that's right. In, in Matthew chapter 16, we get a conversation with Jesus and his disciples that's about a year and a half ahead of his death and resurrection. But it's a prediction of what's going to come. And Jesus, most of the time, he spoke with people. He spoke in stories. He said, it's a lot like, it's a lot like, you know how in the morning this happens, and you know like in the evening this happens in the weather, and you should be able to compare that to this. And in this moment, he is speaking directly and plainly. There is no, what does this mean? This is what this means. And starting in verse 21, he says, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law. Those are not three names of the same thing. Those are three different groups. Anytime you see in the New Testament the idea of the Jewish high council, it's incorporating all of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the elders, the Jewish leaders. It's kind of like throwing the, the big circle around. So he's basically, it's at the hands of the Jewish high council. That he would be killed... But on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not God's. Now, when Jesus then said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, okay, we are absolutely believing and praying that you're inviting friends, you're inviting your family, they're, they're coming to Easter, everything like that, but they're not here now. So this is just for you. If any of you in here wants to be his follower, I need you to listen for you and you alone right now. Don't worry about anybody else. You must give up your own way. You must take up your cross and you must follow me. If you try to hang on to your own life, you're going to end up losing it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you're actually going to save it. What does it benefit you if you gain everything that the world and culture has to offer you, and yet you lose your soul in that process? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in the kingdom. So again, Jesus is speaking as plainly as possible. And he's going, no lies, no, no, not that he ever lied, you know, but like no tricks, no, no clever speech or anything. Here's exactly what's going to happen. At some point in time, I'm going to do, go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be uh, put on trial. I'm going to be murdered. I'm going to be put on a cross and I will defeat death three days later. You want to, God, what is your word? God, what's the future? God, what's going to happen? So God speaks exactly what's going to happen. And then Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him. Lord, the Lord rebuke Lord. How dare you take your own name in vain? You know, like he, he's going, heaven forbid. No, you are actually speaking something against heaven right now. This will never happen to you. God, Jesus, pain, suffering, you are God's chosen. 
You are his anointed and appointed. You, no, no, there is not going to be. If you're following God, there should never be any pain or suffering or loss or hurt or less or losing or sorrow. Any of these things should not be in your life if you are following him. So I rebuke you for thinking that any kind of pain or suffering, any kind of negativity should come into your life. No, Jesus, we are speaking only positivity over your life, over your circumstances. We are believing for better robes. We are believing for bigger synagogues. We are believing for faster camels. We are believing for more comfortable sandals, Lord. God, we just believe it. That is your will, God. We, we don't pray that any, any would suffer. Except, without that suffering, none of us is here. There are often times we will take the same mindset of Peter because he could have said to him in verse 23, get away from me, Peter. He's already changed his name once. And it's not like he's giving him a third nickname. I think this is maybe a little bit for our benefit and for everybody who would read it. To know that the idea of never needing to suffer and never needing to sacrifice and never needing to die to self is a satanic idea. That's not something you hear in church a lot, right? This is not the 80s. What are we, the religious, right? The satanic influences. See, you think that, like, what does it mean to be a Satanist? You're like, oh, well, I guess they go into the woods and they chant and they're like, oh, like, that's not. <laughs> Jesus in the garden prays to the Father in John 17, not my will, but your will be done. The epitome of satanic, demonic thought is not his will, but my will be done. That's the epitome of it. That's what happened in the garden. I have given you everything good. No, I want and you follow. You are setting a dangerous trap because you are seeing things only from a worldly point of view. You're not seeing things from God's point of view. Now, again, I know there are some Star Wars fans in here, and so anytime somebody says trap, all you can hear is Admiral Akbar in your head going, that's a trap, you know? And, and here's the thing. The reason he was saying, that's a trap, is not like, oh, look, I see that trap coming from far away off. That's an attack. An attack you can see coming sometimes from far away off. A trap, a trap is something you do not see coming. A trap is something that is set specifically to hide from you. And so you're like, oh no, I would never get trapped. I would see it coming a mile and away. Friends, you might already be trapped. You might have already been trapped in the idea that you'll see it coming. You'll know when something's wrong in your life. You don't even need to ask God. You don't really need to listen to the message because you'll know, I know, I have the degree, I have the background, I've read about this, I've done this, I've all these kinds of stuff. I don't need that. I went to Bible school. I, 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 I bought a school, at my, bought a Bible at my school. You know, like I dropped my kids off at New Life Kids, you know, and then leave. You know, and I don't think anybody does that. If they do, please don't do that. You know, I, and we, we have all these reasons why, but in fact, what's happened is a trap has been set. If you get to the point where you think, I cannot be trapped, I think you're already trapped. When you have lost the humility to say, I must constantly examine my heart, examine my motivations, examine my perspective, examine my assumptions in light of the culture and influences that I have been through. That way of thinking, elevate yourself avoid pain, follow everything, follow your heart, live your truth, which is an inherently contradictory statement. You could live your own philosophy, but you can't live your own truth. It's a, it's, it's a law of non-contradiction philosophically. But that's, the world is not concerned with lining up. It's concerned with getting you to say, not his will, but my will be done. And that is certainly my way of thinking when pain comes my way when sacrifice comes my way, when discomfort comes my way. Not his will, but my will be done. So we might look at this and go, well, that's fine, but maybe this is just for Jesus. Jesus can go, yeah, Jesus, he died on a cross, right? We're about to celebrate that. Do I have to go to a cross? I mean, when we say pick up our cross, Jesus says this, if any of you wants to be my follower, again, we're talking to you now, we're talking to me. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. 
If you try to hang on to your life, you're actually going to lose it. If you try to hang on to every presupposition and every assumption and every, everything that you came in, with, came in with, trying to be able to follow God, and you're trying to be able to do that at the same time as trying to follow him, you're not going to be able to do it. And in the end, you're going to end up losing both of them. You think, well, at least I'll have worldly comfort. No, but if you're trying to have worldly comfort and trying to follow Jesus, you're end up going to end up with neither of them. Well, I'll lose my soul. Is anything worth more than who you are? Is anything worth more than the part of yourself that belongs to Christ? What are you willing to hold on to and in a chance perhaps lose that? To die to ourself. And he says this, pick up your cross daily at other parts we're gonna read, is to pick up an instrument of death. I would assume in the room like this, there are some of you with cross earrings, cross necklace, maybe a tattoo. You are carrying on your neck an instrument of death. You are carrying an electric chair around your neck. You are carrying lethal injection around your neck. And it's pretty amazing that an instrument of torture and death has become the symbol of hope and resurrection, of joy and peace. I mean, if you want in one tiny little piece of gold to see just how transformative Jesus is, he has taken an instrument of murder and made it a thing of celebration. So when you say, my life is trash, and all, and all everybody knows me as is trash, how could I ever be turned into something that could honor God? Think about the very symbol of our faith itself. It's not something for Jesus to do and for us to go, thank you. It's something for us to do as well, to pick up your cross. Matthew 10, 38. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. Now, that's probably not in the church growth books. But if it's true, it's a pretty dangerous thing not to say, right? If you've got a bunch of people trying to be able to add Christianity on top of an already existing life that they don't want to change, and yet the very foundational perspective of Christianity, the very foundational understanding is, no, you have to give all of that up first before you could even attempt to take on the cross, and then that's never communicated. Perhaps the most unloving thing is to never really communicate it in that way. This is not the Jesus who gave everybody high fives and fish and chips whenever they needed it, whenever they were, had a little snacky hunger. This is a God who is telling you, if you want to come to me, you, I, I want to be honest about it with you. Yeah. I wonder if that, you know, by all statistical evidence, most people become Christians when they're young. I wonder if the reason is because you have less to give up when you're younger. You're like, oh man, I got $4 in my bank account. I, you just take it all, you know, like... <laughs> That's much different when $4,000 is coming into your bank account on a weekly or a monthly basis, right? Because when you're a kid, you're like, $4,000 a month? I'll be able to afford everything that I want. And then you become an adult who gets $4,000 a month, and you're like, but $4,250 would be really nice. And you always find ways to be able to get it. Now you're like, so if I got to tithe 40 cents off of my $4, that's one thing. When I got to tithe $400 off of my $4,000, now we're talking about something. Man, I've been living this way for 20 years. I've been, living, I've been believing this for 35 years. I've been, you know, speaking and thinking and acting that way for 40 years. You're expecting me to make a change now? I think a lot of people look at it and go, that seems nice, but it's too late. It's not. It never is. Yes. Now the weight of it and the power of it 
might be harder, but that's different than impossible. I think we give up a little bit more. And in 23 years of being a Christian, as I was preparing this message, I was compelled to ask this question. What have I died to? What have I given up to follow Jesus? Because if I don't know that, if I can't think of anything, is the danger that it's nothing? And if it's nothing, how could I be really following Jesus? Before I was a Christian, money was never really a huge motivator for me. I was not trying to get rich or die trying. I was, I was not worrying about that very much. And it's not like being rich is somehow anti-Christian. It might be anti-pastor, but that's a different conversation. But it's not, I don't mean like pastors don't get paid a lot. I just mean like it's, we're not in this for the money. We shouldn't be anyways. It's not anti-Christian to have a lot of money. It, the, the challenge over and over again in Scripture is how you make your money. Do you make it in, with justice? Do you make it with honor? And how do you spend your money? Do you hoard or are you generous? It's not, you know, like, rich is bad. Like, no, 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 rich is not bad. How you make the money, how you spend the money. But that was not something I really had to worry about. And to be honest, the moral behavior and framework of Christianity was not really that far away from how I was raised. I did not have to make a ton of concessions and a ton of changes in my moral framework from not being a Christian to being a Christian. But for some of you, those are massive places of death to follow Jesus. Some of you have spent most of your adult life and maybe your childhood thinking about money, thinking about how much you have, thinking about how much you don't have, how to get more thinking about when you'll finally have enough, thinking about what it means to not have it, thinking about what it means to not be able to go out with your friends, thinking about what it means to be friends, who you can even be friends with, how they think about you, how they talk about you, whether you're valuable, whether you're worthy, whether you're a good husband, whether you're a good wife, whether you're a good provider, whether you're a good father, should you spend more time at work or spend more time with your kids and you do all this kind of stuff and everything is about this. And every time, almost every time somebody is offered a promotion with more money, they take it because we think it's a 15% raise in pay. But what happened was when a 15% raise in pay results in a 12% reduction in family time, a negative 4% in church activity, and then only a 1% raise in future earnings potential. And you've actually come out at a net negative. If you have to have the money, you don't consider yourself in a whole perspective of life. You only think about the money. And for some of you, the moral framework of Christianity is incredibly opposite and offensive to the way you were raised. Or to the, maybe not the way you were raised, but the moral framework you took on in your teens and 20s. And you decided, I want to do this. But what does Jesus say? Again, I know the two things that for me were not really that big of a deal might be massive things that are still the thing that you are struggling to fully lay down to fully be able to pick up Jesus. But you have to die to something. You have to. If you're not laying anything down, if you're not emptying your arms of anything, how are you going to be in a place to pick up your cross? What have I died to? Let's not get into too many details, but I'll give you some basics. Parts of my life I've had to give up to pick up the cross. Everyone liking me. That is just not going to happen. It's already not happened. I know that. Winning everyone to my way of thinking. That is not going to happen. Again, because it has already not happened. Being able to do it all. Because that will put me into adrenal fatigue. That'll put me into a depressive state where I can't find any joy and everything in my life seems dark. I'm not talking about hypothetically. I'm talking about what I've already been through. I'm not saying that to make you feel sorry for me but to let you know that those are sometimes the things that are being highlighted to show you 
where there is something of disconnect between the perspective that Christ has called us to have and the perspective that we're having. I am not called to be the richest, handsomest, and most popular person. That doesn't mean following Jesus. But I am called to have a light and easy burden of following Jesus. And so if I feel a heavy or manipulative or dark weight, that means that it may not be Jesus that I am pursuing. I am pursuing an idol, a lie that I need to kill. Not deal with, kill. Always being right. This one I feel like is still in the running. I feel like there's still a chance. Although I don't think your laughter encourages me in that. Again, being married, that's a little tough to keep that one alive. There's always another person hearing your thoughts and you're like, right? And they're like, eh. And you're like, wait. And then you say it again to yourself and you're like, no, oh, that isn't good. You know, like, that's why the Pope thinks he's infallible. He's not married. All right, oldest Christian joke in the book. <laughs> oldest joke. Being able to control all of the outcome with my efforts of everything. So, Hearing that list, some of you might be going, good grief, man, that's what you had to die to? What a rough life. No duh, you had to die to those things. Yeah, I'm sure to some of you, some of that stuff is no duh and super easy. But that's the shape of the cross in my life. And I'll bet you, there are some things in your life that you have or need to die to that I would look at and go, yeah, duh, that's not hard. But that's the shape of the cross in your life. I wonder if we are casual about our following Jesus. I wonder if we're casual about our church attendance and our devotional life and our, and our serving and our giving. I wonder if there is a casualness to that because we didn't realize how much it cost us because we didn't actually give up anything. I mean, if you haven't invested a lot, you don't really worry about cutting your losses, you know? I mean, like, you go to a restaurant, you order a meal you don't like at Burger King or something like that. I know I'm using that term restaurant loosely, but, you know, like, you go there and it's like, oh man, I didn't like my $7 meal. It's not like, whoa, you know, like, hey! I mean, I guess now everybody's yelling at everybody so that you might be go back. But I mean, like, you go to like, if you're like at Burns and they bring you the steak and the steak is not bad, you're like, oh, excuse me! This valuable... So in all you Enneagram nines out there, permission granted to be like, hey, this ain't good. I mean, like, and you gotta be able to get that back because you're like, I invested. I invested. It's not easy for me to walk away from this. Yeah, it's five bucks. What's the big deal? Ah, like, I went to church a little bit. What's the big deal? This is the foundation and framework of my entire existence. That's a little harder to walk away from. See, in Luke 14, 25, it said a large crowd was following Jesus. And so Jesus loved crowds. He loved to thin them. So he turns around and says to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Now, remember, in comparison. You don't need to walk around and be like, what's up, Jeremy? Hate you. Lori, you're pretty stupid. What's up? You know, like, you don't have to hate every, like, it's not that. It's just saying, my affection and attention on Christ is so high. It's so foundational. It's so full. It's so rich. It's so powerful that it doesn't even look like I love the other people because my love here is so great. Not because I have lowered my love down here so much to keep this love even. I keep this love up and I keep going more and more in this. And the deeper I go in knowing how weighty I was and how much I, I have sin, then the more joy and the more power and the more excitement I have in my relationships. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. And if you don't carry your cross, if you don't die to yourself, if you don't lay something down, and probably more than just one thing down, you can't belong to him. I'm not interested in you belonging to me. I'm not interested in you belonging in this way to TNLC. I'm interested in you belonging to Christ. And this, this is what it takes. 
Have you died to anything? Anyone? What have you laid down? Not what are you wrestling through. Not what are you like, ah, got some things I'm working on. Death. Normally, the way we would end a message is I'd kind of go right into something and then give you a in your communities this week and then we'd bring the band right up and go into this. But we're gonna switch that order a little bit. First thing I'm gonna say is in your communities this week or just even when you're, if your community is your discipleship group or your marriage or your friendships or whatever it is, ask, share some of the things you've died to so that you follow Christ. Share them. You don't have to give gory detail, but share some of those things. And then share if there are things you know you need to die to as well. You're like, well, I'm not sure. Well, that's where this is gonna come in. We're gonna spend a moment in prayer and meditation. I want you to, we're, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna reflect, which is us looking back on our lives. We can look back and look internally asking this question, what have I given up to follow Jesus? What moral positions, what idols, what money, what approval, what false identities that told me that I was more than what I really was or told me that I was less than what I really was, that told me that I should have confidence in something other than Christ or somewhere other than Christ? Not where do you need to, but where did you all ready? And then we're gonna take a moment and we're gonna pray and ask God to reveal where we are now and where we need to go. But we're gonna start we're going to start in a moment of meditation and reflection. That's why I said I would encourage you, write it down. Don't edit. You're like, I don't know if that's it. or Don't edit. Write now. Write right now. And then edit yourself and pray through later. So again, whether that's a notes app, whether that's something uh, you know, that you can write on in front of you. And again, I know silence is perhaps the most terrifying thing, so we have a nice little aux keys pad to be able to take a slight edge off of the terror. We're going to take a minute, and we're going to ask God, and reflect and ask God to speak with us. Where have we already died? now as we move into a time of prayer so reflection is something we can do internally looking back but prayer is something we're asking from outside of us prayer is something we're asking from God to speak to us where do we need to where do we need to die so that we might have more of him where do I need to decrease so that you might increase now again write down the things that come to mind don't write don't edit just write how do I know if it's God or me or my spirit or my soul don't worry about all that just write first then we'll come back to editing. Then we'll come back to how to be able to pray through those things. So let's pray. Father, where do I need to decrease and die so that you might increase and live? Would you speak to us now?
we're going to transition to the next part of our service band. You guys can come up and get ready for us. Here's a couple things you can do with this. Number one, if you hear something, something pops into your mind, something pops into your spirit, later on today, tomorrow, sometime this week, still write it down. Take this with you. Keep, keep thinking about this. To be honest, this is kind of like an ongoing practice you should have in your life of gardening your soul to see where the weeds and the hard places are. You should look at the things that are there and to say, is there any clear alignment with scripture of things I should obviously be doing or things I should obviously not be doing? If you don't know how to be able to think through any of those things, that's why we have purple shirts. That's why we've got green tents. That's why we've got pastoral teams. That's why we've got care teams to be able to help you in case you don't know how to answer that question for yourself. But then I want to also ask you, which ones are, were you afraid of exploring? Which ones were you the most hesitant to write down? Which ones were the things you were quickest to, to dismiss? I wonder if there might be something you actually need to press into a little bit there. It might be very uncomfortable, but so is the cross. Discomfort is not a sign that you're in the wrong place. It might actually be the sign that we're getting to the right place. Because the whole point of this, the whole point of decreasing, the whole point of dying to self, the whole point of emptying ourselves of who we are is not just to sit in emptiness and decrease and sadness and stay there. The point of all of that emptying is to be filled. The point of the decrease of ourselves is so there can be an increase of Christ, so that we can be emptied of all of the things of the world, so that we might be filled with all of the things of Christ. So it's not just, oh, let me sit in this darkness and just let darkness watch over me. Let me know where I am. Let me know, let I be honest, what is keeping me? What is a barrier? What is a hindrance to me having the fullness and the completeness and the totality of Christ in my life? Oh God, remove all of it. All of it that hinders me, then I might be able to be filled to overflowing with.